Another brick in the wall was a set of three songs that Pink Floyd made for their 1979 record, The Wall. Part 2 became a massive hit all around the world with its epic cadence and simple mix of disco and prog rock. The song's lyrics was connected to a bigger concept about a man called Pink, who is often thought of as the alter ego of bassist and vocalist Roger Waters. The character goes through a lot of the same personal issues that Waters faced while growing up. But part 2 specifically focused on his rebellion against school teachers who treated their students horribly during the 50s by either beating them or humiliating them in front of the other students. Now, why did Waters choose to write about something so personal in the first place? Let's take a closer look. The idea for The Wall first came to Waters during their In The Flesh tour. Pink Floyd were able to fill up stadiums and large halls of audiences at the time since the success of their previous albums, especially Dark Side of the Moon. But Waters mentioned several times that he didn't feel right about doing these kinds of shows. I disliked it intensely because it became a social event rather than a more controlled and ordinary relationship between musicians and an audience. The front 60 rows seemed to be screaming and shouting and rocking and swaying and not really listening to anything. And those further back could see bug roll anyway. But his dissatisfaction didn't boil over until the last show that they played during that tour at Montreal Olympic Stadium. A bunch of people at the back had set up firecrackers and a group at the front wouldn't stop making noise. Waters stopped the band and tried to calm down the crowd, but when they didn't listen, he spat on them. Pink Floyd producer Bob Esrin asked him to talk to his psychologist friend that night. And to the psychologist, Waters explained his desire and vision to isolate himself by constructing a wall across the stage between them and the audience. And that's how the concept of the wall was created. Although mostly inspired by Waters' personal experiences, The Wall's lyrics tell the story of a character called Pink, who experiences self-imposed isolation because of the loss of his father and the traumatic interactions he has with authoritarian figures. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 is the song that arguably depicts his struggles with authoritarian figures in the most direct and personal way possible. In this song, we're brought into Pink's reality at school, where he's dealing with forceful teachers that crush his soul. We don't need no education. When hearing the opening line, you might see images of revolution and protests. And in many ways, that's what this song is. It's a simple protest song. Waters is obviously criticizing the educational system that allowed teachers to physically and emotionally punish children in the 50s and 60s. But if we read more into this phrase, it reveals two meanings. The sentence contains a double negative. The negatives of don't and no cancel each other out, producing an affirmative statement. We do need education. In this case, it seems like Waters see the value in education, but maybe he wished for a different kind of education. In an interview with Mojo magazine in 2009, he affirmed this by saying, You couldn't find anybody in the world more pro-education than me, but the education I went through in boys' grammar school in the 50s was very controlling and demanded rebellion. In the music video for the song, we see artist Gerald Scarf depicting the school as a meat grinder that the students are shoved into. By taking this into account, I don't think it's far out to say that Waters had some terrible experiences during his school days. Now during the end of each verse, Waters repeats this line. All in all, you're just a As mentioned before, the wall is a physical illustration of water's mental isolation. The bricks represent sources of trauma, and he's trying to ignore them as if they are inanimate objects, as if they were bricks. In this case, he's trying to ignore the teacher and numb the pain that he's afflicting on him. There's also a movie that was made about this whole album that depicts the story scene for scene. And there's a scene where the teacher discovers a poem that Pink wrote. The teacher reads the poem out loud to the entire class and makes fun of him. Poems, everybody! <laughs> the 
lad, he reckons himself a poet. <laughs> this is the type of pain that he is trying to numb. And interestingly enough, the sarcasm about Pink being a poet is also referenced in the song. No dark sarcasm in the classroom. The fact that dark sarcasm is pointed out in both the lyrics and the movie might suggest that Waters was a victim of it himself when he was younger, something he remembers as particularly painful. Now, this is only the second out of three songs that go under the same name on the album. On the track list, they're divided into three parts, as if they're all part of the same song. All the parts have similar melodies and structure, but the overall mood, arrangement, and lyrics of these parts vary a lot from one to the other. Part one is filled with a lot of sadness, emphasized by the lack of instrumental layers, and the lyrics where Pink brings up the topic of his dead father. Part 2 is a lot more anthemic because of its simple disco beat, powerful vocals, and dynamic cadence. It's easy to hear that this is a protest song. Hey, teacher, leave kids alone. But Part 3, on the other hand, has a rather furious mood with its slashing guitars and angular synths. Since the songs bear the same name and melody, it's clear that they play a very central role in communicating the story. In each of the parts, Pink draws new conclusions about his state of mind. First, he sees himself as a victim of other people's actions. Then, he finds new hope and tries to change things around. But then he fails and turns his back on everything in rage. In essence, by having this three-part song on the album, it's very easy to follow Pink's character development. Now, part two is essentially a disco track if we boil it down to its sonic components. The idea of including disco elements was originally producer Bob Estrin's idea, and Gilmore hated this idea. But as he and the band were willing to try it out, they ended up digging it. Now the disco sound was only one of two things that Esrin changed about the track. Initially the song was meant to be way shorter, but Esrin thought the song would be even better if they added another verse. He also thought it would sound great if children sang the second verse and chorus. So he asked engineer Nick Griffiths if he could visit a nearby school and record this. And so he did. Having captured the audio and mixed it together, Esrin called Waters into the studio to have a listen. No Waters, who was against the idea of extending the song to begin with, all of a sudden had stars in his eyes. He really loved this version. About Esrin's contribution, Waters said, It was great. Exactly the thing I expected from a collaborator. Although the concept of the song and the album came from a place of detachment and isolation, fans loved it and resonated deeply with it. And to this day, The Wall is their third most positively acclaimed album after Darkseid and Piper. The song itself charted at number 2 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and several top positions in other charts across the world as well. All in all, I think this song will be remembered as an energetic track for everyone who wants to feel empowered, and maybe it will inspire you to hammer down some of your own walls. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about Pink Floyd and specifically how they recorded their debut album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, then feel free to download the PDF I've linked to in the description. It contains info about their songwriting, recording process, and I've also curated a playlist that will help you get into their earliest albums. So make sure you check that out, and that's it. Cheers.